What happens when you give people complete creative freedom with limited tools? What happens when these people can share their work with the rest of the world? What kind of culture begins to emerge? Everybody Edits was a game created in 2010 by Chris Benjaminson. It began as a simple project called Flixel Walker, which Chris used to test out the multiplayer software development kit for his company Player.io. This is its first screenshot. Chris sent this test to his contacts over Skype. Aside from seeing the other users in real time, there was no way to interact with any of them. Users could only interact with the worlds that were created for them. They were quick to tell Chris that he sucked at game design, so he quickly added the ability for users of the game to edit the world around them. Now, bad level design could no longer be blamed on him, but rather the players. Despite being a silly little test, this simple addition of being able to edit worlds live and have other people interact with them took off. Chris saw that his friends kept coming back for more, and wanted to see if he could expand on the idea. He uploaded a test version to Newgrounds, now titled Multiplayer Platform World, and within 24 hours, it saw more than a thousand plays. The game had potential. Armed with graphics stolen from Facebook and Super Mario Bros., Chris Benjaminson realized that he truly had something unique on his hands. On May 8, 2010, he created EverybodyEdits.com, and the players started to create. When Chris created this new website, he made a few important additions. He added one of the most highly requested features, the ability to create locked rooms, allowing people to build their ideas to their fullest potential without other users destroying them. At this point, the game was a glorified multiplayer paint tool. Since the game was rooted in platforming, Chris wanted to add one more feature to make the gameplay a little bit more interesting. This is the Gravity Era. It can point up, left, or right. When your smiley interacts with it, the direction of gravity changes. You can jump off the sides of blocks, cling to ceilings, gain a bunch of extra speed, and more. Chris also added the dot, which gave the effects of zero gravity. These could be combined in all sorts of ways to create various challenges, which players called mini-games. With these new tools, players started to get creative. It really was a magical time. You could create a level, add some gameplay, and anyone could join and if it was fun, people would play it. Levels could not be saved, so they were typically quite simple, but that was part of the charm. This was the beginning. At this point, trends began to develop. When someone wanted to create a level, they would often draw inspiration from the levels that were popular at that time, and as such, certain types of minigames would start to be seen everywhere. Here are some examples. This is called a tight fit. Since the smiley is about the same size as the gap, the player has to perfectly align themselves in order to jump through. This is a dot trail. Since the dots have zero gravity, a player simply has to follow the trail to pass, but if you slip off, it can be very difficult to regain your grip. This is a pendulum elevator. The player simply has to bounce back and forth, similar to the movement of a pendulum, until they reach the top. This is a high jump. In Everybody Edits, a player can only jump up a wall three blocks high. With enough speed and a precise enough jump, however, a player can just barely catch the side of the up arrow and leap to the top of the wall. And finally, this is called the hook jump. Perhaps the most famous minigame in Everybody Edits, it just requires a couple blocks to build. To beat it, the player simply has to perform a hook movement, jumping around the top block and landing on top of it. None of these minigames were particularly fun to play, but it didn't really matter. If you created an entire level, with a start, end, and gameplay in between, it'd become popular. These minigames, while lacking originality, were easy to create. Because once again, at this point, levels couldn't be saved. If every player in a level leaves, it's gone. Someone could leave their computer on for days on end to keep their level there, but it would only be a matter of time before the servers go down or they disconnect for some other reason. Under these conditions, who would really want to put in the hours into creating a fully original level just for it to disappear? 
On May 10th, 2010, a player by the username Mustang found everybody edits when it was featured on Newgrounds. After playing around with the game, he began to dabble in minigame creation. Over time, he began to develop a style. He enjoyed making minigames that featured precise jumps without being unfair while still maintaining originality. One day, while playing a multiplayer level, Mustang saw a tiny chat link. Upon joining, he ran into the player Mib. Similar to Mustang, Mib's style was characterized by an innovative design. The two began to create maps together, but due to a lack of a save system, none of these levels still exist today. Meanwhile, an anonymous user posts a thread to the V board on 4chan about everybody edits. The thread gains some traction and brings in a bunch of new users to the game. After all, everybody edits is a game in which anonymous players can create whatever they want in the world around them with nearly zero rules. What better place to advertise the game than 4chan? One 4chan user sees the thread and decides to give the game a shot. The day is described as follows. After trial and error, he created his first level. A level of ingenuity and originality that was never before seen. Something that would twist the very core of your brain. Something that would make your internal organs suddenly rupture and steam with what could only be called the devil's hatred. Mindfuck Levels was born. He turns this level into a series, releasing mindfuck level after mindfuck level. He begins to go by the alias MFL and posts each of his levels to 4chan. He keeps creating these worlds, pushing the limits of the physics engine with increasingly innovative designs. While other users were creating minigames that looked like this, MFLs looked like this. When mindfuck level 7 was released, it caught the attention of Mustang, who managed to complete the level. Impressed by his skill, MFL gave Mustang the code to edit the level, and Mustang began to add his own minigames. Soon thereafter, MFL releases Mindfuck Levels 8, and once again, Mustang completes the level and adds his own challenges at the end. This time, Mustang posts on the 4chan thread about the world, and the two begin chatting. Mustang introduces MFL to Mib, and they begin to collaborate on levels, focusing on innovative design and challenging minigames. The three collaborated on a few levels, honing their level building skills and improving at working as a team. Each of their levels thought to be more innovative than the last. Despite this, however, they realized that something was holding them back. In the lobby of Everybody Edits, players have a list of levels to choose from that they can play, sorted by player count. The title of the level and the amount of plays are the only information that is given in the lobby. Therefore, maps with names that stand out are going to attract more players than those that don't. The three realized that to popularize their levels, they should brand them. They created a new level titled X Crew Wrath of Vesuvius with a small X Crew logo in the corner. By pushing out levels with the X Crew seal, players could find their levels with ease and know that they'd be playing a thoroughly tested world with original design and appealing art. Meanwhile, a player by the username of Asli created a private tool titled Asli Build, which was given to X Crew. This allowed them to save their levels and re upload them later. After recruiting some new members and armed with this tool, the crew began to create. And create they did. Each world was better than the last, and level after level, they proved that they could not be matched. Back when other players were still figuring out how to make a simple minigame, X-Crew was pushing the game to its limits. When we compare X-Crew's early levels, we can begin to recognize trends in how they create minigames. Though the levels were created by many different collaborators, the process of minigame creation was standard and followed a few important steps. Let's walk through them. First, we have to go from nothing to something. We may have a certain size of room, a certain place we want it to start and end, but otherwise we have complete creative freedom. Before placing a single block, we have to think of a concept. This doesn't have to be anything mind-bending, it can be as simple as don't touch the ceiling or bounce left to right, but having an idea in mind before you create is key. Otherwise, it's all too easy to revert to boring filler minigames, and in a well-designed level, no bit of gameplay should be taken for granted. Once the concept is thought of, let's test ways to achieve it with the tools in the game. This example is from a minigame by Mustang, in which the basic concept is don't jump off of the top blocks. As you can see, jumping off of these green bricks is safe, but jumping off of the red ones returns you to the start of the minigame. Great, we've turned our concept into a game mechanic. Now let's make it an actual minigame. If we have a few of these jumps in a row, it has a challenge. The player has to precisely maneuver from block to block, ensuring that they don't land on the wrong platform. And finally, we end with the longest step of the minigame creation process, testing. We have an idea in our minds about the path that we want the players to go, 
are there any alternative ways players can get to the end? Furthermore, is the minigame smooth? Is it fun? If we play around with it a bit, we can see that we can completely skip some of the jumps if we get some momentum, but this can be fixed by relocating the blocks. We continue this process of testing and tweaking until finally we are happy with the result. Innovation. That's what X-Crew cared about above all else, and this is clear in their design. In a time when the average world looked like this, X-Crew continued to innovate. On August 18th, 2010, X-Crew announced that they would no longer be creating maps. They would reunite for a few more projects, but their activity would never truly match what they had at their peak. Nonetheless, the influence they had on the game would be seen for years to come. This was the start of Everybody Edits' history, and the members of X-Crew were the authors. Two days after X-Crew disbanded, Chris released the beta package. For $10, players could get 6 extra smileys, some extra blocks to build with, and a single world that they could save. Until now, Asli Build was private and only available to members of X-Crew. Finally, the rest of the community could put the time and effort into making their own levels and attempt to match the attention to detail seen in X-Crew levels. Many users would begin to create their own crews. Most wouldn't last more than a couple levels, but some did gain some traction such as MX Crew, MG Crew, KO Crew, LX Crew, and more. Many of these crews would go on to make excellent levels, and you can see inspiration from X Crew's design in their worlds, but there's a key difference. Most of the time, the concept of the minigame isn't as immediately clear. Instead, gameplay was treated more as a way to fill the space between art. The levels were indeed beautiful, and at the time, very popular, but a majority of them simply have not stood the test of time. Why is that? This leads us to a problem in the design of many levels in 2010 and 2011, including the ones by X-Crew. Users wouldn't really clean up their minigames when they were complete. Obviously, this wasn't true for every minigame, but it was the norm to accept minigames that had a little bit of jank. Minigames like this had a clear path for the player to take, but had many unnecessary blocks and arrows, and movement that might not feel smooth. Because of this, many old minigames feel like they lack a level of polish. Nonetheless, they were impressive feats of creativity at the time. As time went on, Chris added more and more tools in the game for builders to work with. Coin doors let people add progression to their worlds, new block packs let people make more beautiful art than ever before, and portals let people absolutely abuse the physics engine. With these new tools, new worlds with never before seen concepts were created. Some innovative levels from this time include The Vault by X-Crew, Hacker's House of Fun by Coldstorm, and Pinball Bloom by Pinball Crew. Even though builders were given a very limited set of tools to build with, new concepts were being created again and again. Sure, thousands of worlds looked like this, or this, or this, but if you sift through the unoriginality, you could truly find something special. In July of 2011, Chris realized that developing a project as big as everybody edits was starting to become difficult. He decided to hire a professional developer named Peter to help him with the updates. For a few months, Peter helped behind the scenes, adding new textures, optimizing the game, and improving the user interface. 
They continued releasing updates throughout 2011, including the background layer, some new block packs, piano blocks, and more. In December, the drum pack was released. Then? Nothing. For three months, the game lay dormant. Chris did not push out a single update, make a blog post, or communicate with the community in any way. After a year of successful updates, users were left wanting more, but instead they felt ignored. And if you don't feed a community, it'll begin to die. Gradually, the player count began to decline. Before, it was common to see thousands of concurrent players online, but now the game had around 400. A lobby that used to have hundreds of levels could now fit on one page. Finally, on March 28th, there was a new post on the blog. Chris announced that his cooperation with Peter didn't work out and he was looking for alternatives. He contacted a small game development studio in Denmark called Cape Copenhagen and convinced them to send one of their developers to help work on the game full-time. This developer, nicknamed Mr. Shu, began to help with the game, fixing bugs and adding new features. He introduced weekly updates. Every Thursday, at approximately noon UTC, a new update would be added to the game. As Mr. Shu put more time into the game, Chris put less. He was a busy man, and everybody else was never his primary project. Finally, on July 12th, 2012, Chris released his last blog post. From that point forward, the game belonged to Cape Copenhagen. Unfortunately, everybody edits began to have a problem. A problem that would plague the game for years to come. With Mr. Shu doing nearly all of the art, development, and design of the new updates by himself, how much quality can he really put in every week? While many of the features were incredibly useful for builders, many just made the game look sloppy. A game that had a simplistic appeal now looked messy and bloated with not much attention to detail being put into the individual graphics. This can even be seen in the loading screens. The previous ones were simple yet appealing, whereas the new ones were busy and hard to look at. Despite all of this, players continued to create, and while the style of the game started to shift, so did the minigames. Ironically, even though the design of the game became messy, minigame design started to become cleaner. Players realized that minigames that played smoothly were more fun than those that didn't. X-Crew's design of the past was slowly being replaced with minigames that prioritized simplicity and flow. This was a movement, but instead of being led by the first crew in Everybody Edits, it was led by members of the second, MG Crew. MG Crew had created many levels throughout the early years of Everybody Edits, but while they were active, their levels still adopted a messy style of gameplay that came out feeling unpolished. Though the crew disbanded in 2013, a few of its members still continued to play the game and create levels on their own. Some of these members included DC levels and King of the Ozone, and as months went on, they would release more and more levels favoring smoother minigames. For these two, the minigame making process was different. Planning out a minigame was no longer thinking about a concept and executing it, but instead thinking about what combination of movements a player was going to perform. Instead of planning out a minigame in its entirety and making it work from there, what if Level Maker just added some arrows and watched where they went? There was one more MG crew member, one who took this new style and ran with it. He became an inspiration for many new and veteran world builders alike, with his style soon being mimicked across all of everybody edits. Stage crew completely disregarded this old method of minigame creation. To him, these concepts are cool and all, but to make a minigame truly feel right, it has to create itself. Begin with an empty room, for instance. We have a starting point, and that's it. Now, instead of planning out a path or thinking of a concept, let's just look at our options. The smiley has to go right somewhere, so let's make them slide to the right. Let's even out a jump. Now we're on this platform. We're running out of space, so let's make the player go left. Maybe a jump to utilize all of the space. Since we've got all this height, let's use it. A pool of up arrows should do the trick. Maybe one more jump to make the minigame more challenging. Finally, a slide back to the left should finish it off. That was it. Obviously the minigame maker would have to do testing and tweaking, but for the most part, the creation process was pretty simple. Not only was the style of minigame fun to play, but it was far easier to make than the challenges of the past. 
In the summer of 2014, these players created NSFW Crew and demonstrated a new way to design minigames. They didn't make many worlds, but each level they did make was a display of beautiful art and elegant gameplay. They recruited a couple new members, each with their own version of the style, and each member of the crew would make solo builds that further demonstrate this new slidey minigame style. As the years go by, the player count of everybody edits continues to decline. Cape Copenhagen acquires the rights to LEGO and begins work on a LEGO Ninjago mobile game. Being far more profitable than a dying Flash game, Mr. Shu is allotted less and less time to work on everybody edits. The game goes without updates for an entire year and is eventually passed on to whoever will take it, for example, a 15 year old kid from the Netherlands. The game trades hands a few times over the years to a former X crew member back to NVD and finally to an EE veteran and musician. Despite this, the slidey minigame style remained pretty consistent. It was easy to make, smooth to play, and you could make it your own style. More and more users began to adopt the style, new and old players alike. In 2015, Noob's team introduced the campaign system, allowing staff to feature well-made levels for the community to play for rewards. Now, after five years of the game being a sandbox, world builders were given some guidelines to follow in how to create their levels. Sure, you could still build whatever you wanted, but having your world campaigned meant more plays, more publicity, and your world would be cemented in everybody at its history forever. Who wouldn't want that? At this point, the staff desperately wanted easy levels to give newer players something to play. They host contests with the rule that the levels must have a difficulty of easy. Anything harder is disqualified and the winners are automatically put into campaigns. This campaign system begins a feedback loop of siphoning creativity from the community. The staff team selects levels that they deem worthy of being campaigned, which then causes the community to mimic those levels to have their own worlds campaigned, then those levels are mimicked further, and so on and so forth. These staff in charge of these campaigns thus have a lot of power over the community and over the game as a whole. Campaign good creative levels, and more should come. This is Endless Pain. Created by NSFW member Kira Ninja in December of 2015, it lived up to its name. Touching any one of these spikes kills you and there are thousands of them. At the time of its release, it was likely one of the hardest, if not the hardest level in all of everybody edits. Surely the staff wouldn't put this level in a campaign. Right? On November 6th, 2016, the Perpetual Frustration Campaign was added. Hey look everybody at this community, make a level like this and it might get campaigned. The game continues to receive updates over the years, but it doesn't matter much. The player count of the game continues to decline. The 2,000 concurrent players of the past becomes 500, then 100, then 50. At this point, minigame making is a pretty consistent style. World building slows, but a few users and crews keep releasing new amazing levels. Some of these were amazingly designed, but didn't really get the recognition they deserved. On July of 2017, Adobe announces that Flash will be discontinuing at the end of 2020. After over 10 years, everybody edits his final day was rapidly approaching. Built into the game was a time bomb an update that prevents the players from joining the lobby, and it was set to go off as the clock strikes midnight on New Year's Day 2021. On the final day, users flock back to the game to see it for one last time. A few look through their worlds, talk to their friends, or create one last level. Users who haven't logged onto the game in years show up, because after all these years, it was finally time to say goodbye to everybody edits.
Flash I'm is dead? I'm lagging so much. Burn it. Burn it all down. Fire. Yeah, fire. Yeah, fire. Oh, uh, why is EE e still up? Well, uh, they lied. Xeno failed again. Oh my God. Uh, <laughs> so much. Hey. Oh, 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 there we go. Oh, I'm out. Yeah. <laughs> The clock strikes 12, and the game is shut down. After 10 years, it was all gone. Well, not really. Everybody edits may be gone, but the community is still alive. A reboot is in the works by the new owner of the game, Satania, and it's supposed to be a spiritual successor that'll revitalize the community with new content. Additionally, an offline client was made for everybody edits, and a few of us have been using new mods to absolutely break the game and push it to its limits. If you're interested in either of these things, links will be in the description. Thanks for watching.